So let's get started with today's message. Uh, we're continuing. Uh, it's just a reminder, we started not this August, but the August before with, in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, this is what we do. We teach through books of the Bible, and, and we've continued through the Gospel of Mark until the Lord says, um, stop now, I've got an urgent message for the church. And this is what he did back, in, um, back at the end of September and, and said, I want to bring this church into a closer relationship with me. Uh, I'm going to do some wonderful things through the body of the church and through the members of the church, but this church has got to come back into obedience, yeah. into a reverent fear is what he said. Amen. So in the last, this is our week three that we're talking about uh, giving and tithes. And um, so this is what we're going to continue. So today we're actually going to talk about getting serious about giving cheerfully. And if I can pray for this word and we'll get in. And so Father, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We we are so grateful for this season. It is a good, good season. We have dug the trenches like the prophet told in uh, 2 Kings. And through those years of digging faithful trenches, we are seeing the, the rivers of flowing abundance. Through the, the individual and collective lives of the body of this church, Lord, we thank you for that. We're grateful. We pray for this word. It's a good word given by the Holy Spirit. And I pray that, that the hearts are ready to receive and that I only speak the words that you allow me to speak. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to take real quick, I want to show you some good fruit. This was yesterday. And this was a, a casual men's breakfast. Don Sarlo offered to cook breakfast. And um, this, is, this is good fruit. These are good godly men. This is a church of good godly men. You know, when I left six, 26 years of law enforcement, special operations, undercover 12 years and SWAT 16, the Lord told me to, to, to build a warrior culture. Amen. We are raising godly leaders for ungodly times. I will tell you that perilous times are coming. Perilous times are coming. And this church is called to be a light. All of us are called to be a light. So this is good fruit. And thank you, Don, for taking the lead and leading men well. So the one thing the Lord put on my heart is let's get serious about giving cheerfully. And why is it important? Because God is calling you into a deeper relationship with Him. You see, your hearts, they set the pace of the race back to the Father. You see, giving... Not words or intentions. Acts of generosity are the measure of your true attitude towards generosity. Amen. What is your heart? What does your giving show about your heart? And I'm not just talking about your monetary value. The giving of your time. There's so many families in this church who home people that are not related to them, that they don't even know who they are really. That's the heart of a father. So if we can stand, and I want to, we're going to read together as the body, an anchor scripture that gives an illustration of what it means to be truly generous. We're going to read from uh, Matthew 25, 34 through 40. This is the NLT. And let's read together as the body. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteousness will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for shepherding a church mm. that feeds, that clothes, that homes. Thank you, Lord. So I do, I hope that you've been challenged by this series or enjoyed it or possibly both. What I will tell you is that Satan has done a masterful job in making money hard to talk about. It's hard for married couples. It's hard for church bodies. 
Because he knows that topics left unspoken breed suspicion. This is a transparent church. It is a strong biblical leadership. There is a strong financial accountability team. So there is nothing that we will not talk about. Because there is no room for suspicion in the light of Christ. So I am truly grateful that we've got a body that loves the Lord's word more than the culture's ways. So I am. I'm excited about today's word. Uh, We're going to talk about giving. So what brings us to this point of giving is scaffolding. And you say, what? Well, let me back up. In math education, there's a concept called scaffold of knowledge. And what it means is you've got to learn the basics, the foundation, before you can add the different layers. So take me, for example. I barely learned multiplication. I barely learned addition. I was good to know um, whole numbers. But our kids are talking about calculus and all these things. And I'm like, y'all don't talk about that stuff at the table. I'm just trying to figure out some basic math. But what I will tell you is my kingdom multiplication is solid. Scaffolding is what we're teaching in the relationship principle of coming closer to God. You've got to know the base foundation. That's why Elder Joe and and Jimmy Wright, while they're teaching uh, Sunday school, and most of we all grew up when we were saved, we all enjoyed Sunday school. We went back to the basics of Sunday school, Christianity 101, to lay the basic foundations. Scaffolding is what we're doing. Scaffolding is what this message is. It's teaching us the base foundation and how to grow closer to God. And you see, the the foundation is grounded in obedience to God's Word. It's not emotion. It's not your feeling. I will say it to get it out of the way. Jesus is not your boyfriend. He is a holy, reverent God who deserves our worship. Deuteronomy 11.1 tells us, Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God and keep His charge, His statutes, His judgment, and His commandments always. 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 This is an end when the New Testament begins. This doesn't end after the second chapter in the book of Acts. This is always. You see, truly loving God means keeping His commandments. There's no plan B. So I want you to look at the three levels of scaffolding in God's relationship and building process. Level one, and it's going to be a little recap over the last couple of weeks, is the principle of first. God set the, pre- the precedent by giving to us first. Let's be clear about that. Amen. Genesis 1, 1-2. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God gave first. And when God, when He asked for our our, our best through first giving, our first fruit, when He asked us to give back what He first gave to us, this is our opportunity to show holy obedience, to show reverence to God who first gave to us. Romans 11, 16 tells us, For if the first fruit is holy... The lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Why are the branches holy? Because Jesus is holy. Jesus is our first fruit. God first gave to us. We are to reflect the character and the nature of God in learning to give, to be generous. Level two in this scaffolding process is obedience to the tithe. God established the tithe to help keep Him as our heart's priority. So I ask, is God really first in your life? And if you're honest, you'd be like, I don't know, how do I tell? That's a good question. Do you tithe? You see, let me be more clear. Do you tithe to God the Father? Or do you tithe to one of the many gods of this world? Like Starbucks or Netflix or gym memberships you hadn't used in three years? Who are you tithing to? Because I will tell you, Everybody gives. Matthew 6.21 tells us, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he was establishing order in the early church, in 1 Corinthians 16.1-2, 
He's, he's teaching obedience and order to a holy God. Now, regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you see, things don't change. There's always questions about money. And there's usually misunderstanding about what's to be done with it. And I'll be honest, we talked about it last week. We, we, we did soul care. We broke some, some soul ties. There's been some manipulative teaching that has really hurt some people for the purpose of, of, of monetary prosperity, not kingdom multiplication. So if you got questions, amen. So did the church in Corinth. So did every early church. But here's Paul establishing order. Now, regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, and I will tell you, when people, oh, well, that's the Sabbath. No, no, in the early church, they honored the day that Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. That became the day that the early church honored God, honored Jesus, was on Sunday. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. What I will share with you is Paul is telling the people to bring their tithes. A tithe is a portion is 10%. Bring it to the church. Bring it to the church. You see, what Paul's going to do now that he's teaching this, and I will tell you, Paul's very practical. He says, don't wait till I get there and then try to collect it. See, this is a trick of the devil. They keep pastors so wrapped up, worried about keeping the lights on, keeping the, uh, the eviction notice off the door, worried about paying, paying for communion cups, that they don't spend time building their altar, their personal relationship with the Lord. Instead of pitching their tent and building their altar, they're over here worried about building the tent. And so you find a pastor dry. You find a pastor without a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit because they're not building their altar, because they're having to be bill collector and run around trying to, trying to get folks to, to, to honor the Lord. What I will tell you is that's not this church. It's not this pastor. We understand that we have pitched the tent, and as a body, we are building our altar our personal relationships with the Lord. But Paul is keeping this straight. Now, the next level in scaffolding, Paul's going to address in 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 6, and 8. The third level is giving. And, and, and I love Dave Ramsey. I really do. I don't know how you feel about him, but I love this quote. He says, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. You see, God's abundant provision, it stands on two legs, obedience and generosity. In America, on average, about, 20, about 21% of all Christians who attend church faithfully tithe or give. 21%. What I will tell you is a main source of the reluctance to give is linked to the words that we use. It's linked to the words that we use. If you do anything other than, than, than sharing the scripture, sharing the truth, then our man-made words, they become suspect. And they should. If it's not rooted and grounded in scripture, we should start asking questions. But I want to give you an example that where the confusion over wording. You see, a lot of times we start to use words interchangeably. Maybe we don't understand the meaning of one, or we prefer the meaning of other. Maybe we're just trying to conflate the two together to make something that, we, that suits our own needs. But I will tell you that, that it doesn't diminish the true meaning of the original word. So, for example, what is, the, what is the biblical difference between sin and iniquity? Like, those are words that are used interchangeably. But there's a, there's a distinction, there's a biblical distinction. Sin is an act that goes against God's will or moral law. Iniquity is premeditated and continuing uh, an intentional sin. You're now almost in a reprobate mind, a state of rebellion. A practical application is David when he was on the roof and he fell into the sin of temptation when he saw Bathsheba. He could have repented of that sin. But you see, in iniquity, he kept thinking about it and he kept thinking about it. And it wound up manifesting itself in, in, in murder and adultery. You see, what I will tell you is, is what is interesting, and it's Lanyap. This is extra. And down in the bayous of South Louisiana, Lanyap means extra, free. 
You see, when Bathsheba was in the water, she had just come out of her, her season or time of being unclean. She had to separate herself, and she had to bathe. It took seven days to be separated from the household. David didn't just see that old girl and decide, I got I to gotta, I gotta DM her, uh, her direct messages. He had seven days to think about that. He had seven days to repent from his sin, but he spent seven days in iniquity. That's the difference in the words that we use. That's the difference of understanding. So what's the biblical difference between tithing and giving? Well, tithing is a set 10% established as first fruit offered back to God. It's 10%. Why? Because tithe means what? Tenth. We can't negotiate it down. It's tenth. Giving is voluntary, and it's motivated by generosity. Many Christians use tithes and giving interchangeably. But as we've learned, as we know from Scripture, each has very different purposes. Applying both correctly brings balance. I've shared before that your giving begins. If you give 10.1%, that 0.1 is your giving. Is your giving. You cannot substitute your giving as an, alter, as an alternative to the tithe. Nowhere in Scripture will you find that option for avoiding God's command. John 14, 15 tells us, If you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. I don't care if that command was in Genesis 1-1. I don't care when that Genesis is in Deuteronomy. If you love me, keep my commands. You see, in giving, the beauty of giving, that includes so much more than a first fruit offering of the tithe. It, it's any form of generosity. It could be money or, or, or property or your homes or your times or your gifts and your talents. Like that's giving. Yesterday, all the fruit, the good fruit in the backyard in the Sarlo's home, that's giving. That's generosity. You know, giving can also be directed at the local church where you say, we, we have a, a build this house campaign. You know what? I want this to go specifically to that. And that's what giving goes to. Giving can be direct giving. Lee and I love to direct give to people. He, I love it. I have, chased, I have chased people down on the street on their bicycles because the Lord said, you go give them what's in your wallet. Now, Little, little interact, a little weird in the beginning, but uh, after I've circled them a couple times and worn them out, and I give them the money and tell them the Lord loves them. Uh, but, but you see, giving has no limitation. And, and it's not restricted by a tenth. What I want to tell you is that giving reflects a heart of charity and love. So you say, well, that sounds good, but why do we give? Well, it's simple. God gave to us first. Like, I really shouldn't have to go any further than that. We should turn off the mic and all go to our favorite restaurant. Because God gave to us first. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're going to talk in just a little bit. How do you quantify generosity? Let me tell you, when people say, I always say, like, this is one of my pet peeves. I know we shouldn't have pet peeves. When people say, I love you so much, you'll never know. Like, you can never know how much I love you. Like, don't do that to anybody. Can you imagine how manic that makes your, your kids or your spouse? Well, like, what does that mean? You can never know how much I love you. Like, you do not love me at all? Do you love me a little bit or do you love me a lot? Like, quantify. God quantifies how much he loves you. How much does he love you? He loves you so much that he gave what? His only son. That's rock-solid scripture. That is quantifiable love. You see, our giving is a reflection of God's character. Genesis 1.27 tells us, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now y'all know, there's only two. There's male and there's female. There's only two. And I don't mean this to, 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 to lambast. I mean this to sh that we need to show a heart of compassion. We need to have a heart of compassion. But that compassion has got to be based on the truth of the word. Amen. We cannot be, well, maybe, no, maybe. 
There's two. Because God created two. And I will tell you, image, in the Hebrew, it's teslam. It is a deeper reflection of God's character and God's attributes. You see, we have the teslam, the image of God. We are called, we actually carry a piece of the divine within us. Because we image, because we teslam, we were created in the image of God. We also, if you're a believer, you receive Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. You also carry the supernatural within you. If you say, I'm only, I'm only human, stop saying that. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were not only human. You were supernatural because of the supernatural of God that lives with inside of you. You are supernatural. So part of God's character is giving. We are called to give as he gave. So this is the fun part. Let's get serious about giving cheerfully. It is the principle of reaping and sowing. Proverbs 11.25 tells us, The generous will prosper. And you're like, I dig it. I want to prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. You see, there's there's a variable in giving, reaping, and sowing. It actually requires that you first sow so that you may reap. You see, in contrast to the tithe, the tithe is a set 10%. Why? Because tithe means tenth. All God's asking is he gave you 100% first. You keep the 90%. Honor me. Honor my word. Return to me the tithe. The first fruits that redeems the rest. But giving, there's no limit. But there is an adjustable variable. And that variable is your heart for generosity. The truth is, what you sow, you reap. Now, it doesn't only apply to to money. If you sow love, you'll reap love. If you sow discord, you'll reap chaos. Like, I've never planted a watermelon seed and an apple tree pop up. Whatever the DNA is in the seed that you plant is going to be returned to you. Luke even gives a similar witness. The same measure you give, you get back. Um, Luke 6, 38 tells us, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. You know, sometimes you got to ask hard questions. And the hard truths are when people, well, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not, God's not giving me anything. So the question should not be, why is God not given to me? Your question should be, why have you not first given to God? You see, there's a lot of believers. They feel, I'm going to take a dollar. It's not a slot machine. I'm going to put my dollar in the, in the slot machine, and I'm going to pull the arm, and I'm going to hope for that, for that million-dollar jackpot. That's not the way the kingdom works. The kingdom is a system of governance, laws, rules, regulations. It's not, to, it's not to diminish your life. It's to give you the structure to live your best life. We've all got kids and grandkids. We'll have our first grandson in December. And what did you do to your houses? You made sure the doors were locked, the fences were locked, the electrical outlets were plugged. You secured the structure of your home. And then you told those little rascals to go live your best lives. This is what the kingdom of God is. There's structure. There's orders. There's rules. So if you think you're going to play the Lord like a slot machine and give them a dollar and and get a return of $10,000, you are fooling yourselves. And I don't want us to be fooled. I want us to know what the word of the Lord says. You see, Paul builds the second layer of the scaffolding. Remember 1 Corinthians, he came to the church in Corinth, and he said, this is how you handle the tithe, the structure, the honor of obedience to a, to a holy, reverent God. So then he goes to the scaffold the next level in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, the cheerful giver. But I say this, again, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Today's terms, who gives a little gets a little. And who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. 
So let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you, always having all sufficiency, all things, may have an abundance for every good work. You see, Paul is teaching the local churches that giving is a matter of the condition of your heart. You should not give to God with the same heart that you pay your taxes. You should not give to God with the same heart that you give your Netflix subscription or your Cowboys tickets. I cannot stress enough that we've got to return to a, to a posture of reverent fear for a sovereign God. So how do I know if I'm being generous? Look, I get this question a lot, and I know that it's curiosity and confusion for believers. So let's look in the book. How do you quantify generosity? Scripture sets the standard for generosity so that when you do give, that you're confident that you're following God's command and that you are giving generously. See, we set one, one quantifiable status for knowing how much you love. We know how much God loves us. He doesn't love us big like the world. He doesn't love us more than you can ever know. He loves you so much that he gave his only son. That's a quantifiable measure. So generosity, what does it look like? Well, let me tell you. Here's two standards. The first is the widow's two mites from Mark 12. Now, Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. Jesus is in the temple or today's church. He is there. Listen, he's here. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that this poor widow who has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had. Her whole livelihood. So, I want to ask you a question. Are you generous? What if you give a quandron? Well, I don't know. What's a quandron? It was the smallest denominational, val uh, de uh, denominational value of a Roman coin. It was about 1 64th of a day's value. Today's value, $2. So who's up for giving $2 and being counted as generous? Woo! I'll give $2. All right, well, hang on. See, the widow didn't give $2. Let me show you what she actually gave. Mark 12, 44. She gave out of her poverty. She put in all that she had. What did she have? Her whole livelihood. The Cambridge Dictionary defines livelihood the way someone earns the money that they need to pay for food, a place to live, clothing, necessities. This sister gave everything. Everything. No show of hands. Who has literally given their livelihood? I mean, your house, your car, your furniture, every penny in the bank has given it to God. You see, this is a, an example of biblical generosity. And it's to teach you that it's not about the amount. It's about your heart for giving. It's about your heart for giving. So this is a sister that gave $2. Let's go to the other side. This is the other standard for generosity. This is the anointing at Bethany. This is Mark 14, 3, 5. And being in Bethany, now I want to make this connection back to the Gospel of Mark. You remember, we started, we started in the last week of Jesus' life on earth. It is one week in the life of Jesus. Teaching is going to take us about six or seven months. Because it is Scripture, it is deep, and you do not rush through Scripture. But before we started, if you remember, the, the, when he went in on Palm Sunday, he is staying in Bethany. This is before that time. I just want to make a connection back to where we were in the Gospel of Mark. So Mark 14 says the anointing at Bethany is where he was staying. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, he sat at the table. A woman having an alabaster, alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. 
But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why is this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. You know what I want to tell you is, things don't change. You know, there's a lot of naysayers. Why in the world would they do this? Why in the world would they do that? Why are they so generous? Because they don't understand the heart of giving. You see, the second example of generosity is about pouring out a full bottle of perfume. So you might say, well, that ain't bad. I got an old bottle at home. I got some old spice from the 70s. I'm going to pour that out when I get home. But can I tell you, you know that's not what we're talking about. I want you to take a closer look. 300 denarii. Do you ever wonder when the scripture specifically gives a dollar amount or a geographical location or things? It's because it's a reference point. It's a relevance point. You see, 300 denarii, it equaled one year's salary. The 2023 average American income is $48,060. This sister poured out the equivalent of $48,060. I ask you, if you're... I'm generous. I'm a generous giver. Have you ever given one year's salary to God? How about this? Have you ever left your profession to serve the church full time for one year? For free. You see, this is the second step or the second side in the quantification of generosity. And again, It's not that, well, no, I didn't. What does that make me? Well, it it makes you focus in on the numeric amount. I want you to focus on the heart of the giver. But I just want you to know that there's quantifiable definitions of what generosity is. It's a measuring stick. And what I will tell you is that words matter. Words matter. You see, they can create confusion that stop believers from receiving God's blessings. And they can also limit the relationship with God. What I'm going to tell you is you cannot be casual or flippant about giving and declaring that you're generous or cheerful. I just do believe that we're just too casual when it comes to honoring the Word of God. We're too casual. We're flippant, almost to the point of arrogance. Oh, I'm a cheerful giver. I'm generous. How do you quantify generous? What I want to tell you is that it's not based on your feelings. It's based on God's Word. All of His Word. I've told you, and I will continue to say it, that the Bible's not a salad bar. You cannot pick and choose the parts that you like and disregard the rest. A holy, reverent God. Every word. And I want to wrap Mary. This is Mary that, that, that poured that oil. Two things, right? She broke the flask. She didn't unscrew it and give a little dip and doubt. She broke the flask. There is no putting oil back in a broken flask. Are you willing to break the flask? Go all in for Team Jesus. You see, she wasn't giving, it wasn't the monetary value of a year's wage. She gave, her, she gave Jesus her heart. And her generosity did not go unnoticed by God, by Jesus. Matthew 26 tells us, I tell you the truth. Now listen, this is Jesus talking. This is Jesus in your home family edition Bible with the giant red letters. This is Jesus. I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deeds will be remembered and discussed. How do we know that Jesus' words are true? Because here we are thousands of years later doing what? Remembering what she did. And discussing that act of generosity. God always rewards giving with the right heart. Now I'm going to tell you, there's always a counterfeit. Everything God created, the devil counterfeits. He's got to counterfeit because he cannot create. He counterfeits everything. God gave an opportunity to give with a cheerful, generous heart. So when you give with the other side, there's also consequences. You see, there was an extreme example in the early church. We go to the book of Acts. And this example had to be made to to really let it set in. 
that you've got to take God serious. You're going you're to revere. You're going to fear the Lord. Or there's going to be consequences. You see, there was a couple back in the, in the early church, Ananias and his wife Sapphira. And they gave, and they loved the attention when they talked about the amounts that they gave. But you see, their heart, their heart loved the amount of money that they gave more than God who they gave the money to. And I will tell you, it literally cost in their lives. You see, a heart that chooses uh, to love money over God, it brings death to the relationship with God. Now, I'm just going to highlight some of this, but I do challenge you to go back, and I want you to read Acts 5, 11 through, uh, 1 through 11. And I want you to see the full story. But what's happened, right, and I'm going I'm to highlight it, is that here's a couple, and they sold a piece of property. They liked the recognition of telling people that they were big givers. So they sold a piece of property, and they, they went to the church, and they said, hey, 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 here's the money from the property. Now listen, it's your property. It's your money. What you want to do with it, you do with it. But when you move into a posture of corruption and deception, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's all the money. That's everything. The old boy found himself dead. Boots up. Because he, because he lied. Because his heart was corrupt. You see, they didn't have to give all the money for the land. But they had to be honest about their heart for giving the money that they received from the land. And then his wife, Sapphira, comes in a little bit later and they ask her the same question. So the other thing where he lied and she swore to it. And she found herself up, boots up. So let's jump into this part, Acts 5. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Now that's pretty extreme. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Great fear came upon all the church. Not scared fear, reverent fear. And I want to ask you, what do you think happened once a holy, reverent fear of the Lord fell upon the church? What do you think happened? Well, let's look at Acts 5.12. Continuing power in the church. Continuing power in the church. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were with all, with one accord in Solomon's porch. Now Solomon's porch was right on the outside of the temple. It's where they gathered. It was the church. I don't want you to miss this, church. Don't miss this. God's power continued in the church. Why? Acts 5.11. Great fear came upon all the church. A holy, reverent, obedient fear came upon the church. You see, the people didn't scatter in the presence of a holy Lord. What they did was they grew united. They encountered many signs and many wonders. You know, signs in the Greek is simian. It means a remarkable event, a wonder, wonderful appearance, extraordinary phenomenon. Wonders is teros in the Greek. It means miracles. Who wants to see signs and wonders in their life? Who right now, in whatever season in your life, could really do for some signs and wonders in your life. It could be the, the, the taking you out of a situation of debt. It could be simply introducing a new friend into your life. Who is up to see signs and wonders? And where do they occur? Well, let's go back to 511. They occur where great fear came upon all the church. What I will tell you, God moves and atmospheres of holy, reverent fear Amen. of the Lord. Not where the emotions are stirred. Not where the, the lights are, are flicking and flashing and there's smoke. And not when the, the worship band is rocking out to your favorite contemporary tunes. You see, when Kurt sang that hymn, he's singing scripture. Who, hmm. I told I said, that's not fair. <laughs> you got me. That unlocks. That reminds. That enforces a holy, reverent fear of the Lord. Not stirred emotions. Not fickle feelings. Not surface level friendships. God moves in atmospheres of holy, reverent fear of the Lord. 
Mm. And Kurt, if you want to come up, I mentioned your name. I know the Holy Spirit put you on my heart. But I want to share an equipping moment. And, and this is, we are, we're an equipping church. We're in Ephesians 4, 11, 12, five-fold ministry church. We, my job is to train, equip the body to do the work of the ministry. So I want to train for just a second. I told you a while back that the Lord had called me into a season of fasting. There were some questions I had. There were some things that he wanted to reveal. And, and so I've been through five weeks of water fasting. Now, I'm telling you this as a lesson and over these five weeks, the Lord has revealed and he has confirmed and he has corrected. And, and so, you know, and every day it's not a, hey, hey, you're going to do a 20, we've done 21 day fast before. And I'm like, if I could just stay to this day, I'm going to win. But that's not the purpose. And that wasn't this time. The Lord said, I'm not going to tell you when to finish. Do you trust me? Yes. Then take another day. Do you trust me? Yes. Then take another day. And last night, when I'm reading this scripture, he said, son, I've answered all your questions. I've revealed everything for the body of this church in this season and this time. And this is what I want to share with you right now. So number one, the Lord told me, enjoy a supper with your family. Your fast is broken. So we all sat down and had soup. <laughs> but, but, church, I've been sharing on this series of, of relationship building. It's because God wants to use you. And he wants to use Five Stones Church as an example in these dark times. I will tell you that the word of the Lord is so clear. He wants to multiply his power in this church amongst his people. That's you. He wants to, he wants to, the, the lost and the lukewarm to see how he provides abundantly for his covenant family. That's you. But to carry the anointing of signs and wonders, we must come to him in a holy, reverent fear of God. That must be you. Amen. Amen. That starts with obedience to his word, for reflecting his character. His character is reflected through the, through the tithe and the giving. Now, there's other ways that he wants his character reflected. But this is the starting point for the church. So who wants God's power? Who wants God's power? You are the church within which God wants to move. You are the church. You were gathered in Solomon's porch. You are the body that great fear fell upon the church. You are the church where God's power continues. Amen. You are the church where God wants to show great signs and wonders. Hallelujah. But there's got to be a holy, reverent fear of the Lord. Amen. I challenge as individuals and as the corporate body of Five Stones Church to honor God's commands with the tithe and the giving. So what? Acts 5.11 So that great fear will once again fall upon God's church and that continuing power through the church. I pray through the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were done among the people and they were all within one accord in Solomon's porch. Church, if we can stand and if you'd allow me to pray us out. I'm thankful for this time. I want to make the offer that if, that if there's anyone that has not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I invite you to make that decision today. And if you're, if you're unsure what that means or if you're uncomfortable with, with a public profession, then you meet with one of our elders and they will pray with you and they will teach you and they will guide you. Somebody said yesterday at our men's breakfast, um, don't leave this world the way you came into it. What I will tell you is if you came into this church and you've not received Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, do not leave this church in the same state. I am, I am making the invitation. So Lord, Father, we thank you. We praise you. We are so grateful, Lord, that, you, that you've given us this, this teaching, this correction, this encouragement. 
We thank you that the, that the kingdom is a governance system of laws and rules and regulations. That it's not based on our opinion or influenced by the, by the ways of the world. We thank you for the eternal word of the Lord. We thank you, Father God. We commit to you as a, as a people of destiny, as a people of covenant, Lord, that we will love you by keeping your commands. That we will not love you on our own terms. That we will love you as you command us to love you. As a holy, reverent God. And Lord, we willingly receive the abundant blessings by a good, good Father. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.